Does truth exist? Because you have faith, does that make this book true? Does God exist? So when someone says there is no truth, if you apply the claim to itself, what should you say? Is that true? They don't think Christianity is true. They're talked out of it. You know why they're talked out of it? Because they've never been talked into it. Cross-examining skeptical and atheistic views. Welcome to cross Examine with Dr. Frank Turek. Well, it's not Dr. Frank Turek, but it is Jay Warner Wallace sitting in for Dr. Frank Turek. I'm not a doctor. I'm just a detective, and I'm hoping to help you today process some stuff that I think has become incredibly pressing in culture. I've been talking with Frank about this, and so if you're like me, you've probably gotten uh, someone sent you at some point in the last week. Um, a video or an article that describes a large overarching conspiracy involving the pandemic, involving our response to the pandemic, any number of things. Uh, I certainly have gotten my share. And so Frank and I started talking about this because when it comes to conspiracies, this is something that I might be able to help you with only because um, I get to work conspiracies for a living and have uh, investigated a number of conspiracies and has, have successfully filed these with the DA and have even been able to prosecute those successfully. So I, I'm just going to try to give you some insight into the nature of conspiracies and what my response typically is when somebody sends me one of these videos. Now, now look, in my position, like Frank, I'm online a lot and I get sent these videos by a number of people who either read my books or have followed me on the website, uh, listen to the podcast, whatever. And they will call and, or, or write to me and say, hey, Jim, what do you think of, of this thing? Um, so what I'm going to do from now, I'm going to try today in this uh, show to give you the most complete response I can give you for, with principles that I, I hope you will keep in mind when you're evaluating these conspiracy theories. And and I'm going to point people to this uh, radio show in the future, both when they write to me or if I want to respond, I'm just going to point people to this list of responses, this list of, of principles, because I think this will be the most complete grouping of these principles. And we got a lot to cover today. But I think when we get done, you will also hopefully find this useful and be able to point others to these principles, or at least keep them in mind when you are uh, sent a video or an article claiming that there's a large uh, overarching conspiracy theory or conspiracy occurring. So uh, let's just jump right into this. I'm going to give you uh, my responses to these based on my investigative experience working these kinds of cases. And how this started when I got the first email from somebody who said, hey, what do you make of this video? Well, it, it, you've probably seen the different videos that are out there. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's an article online at um, Get Religion. Uh, which is at getreligion.org. It's uh, this week, in which it's a few days ago, in which it's entitled Plandemic News at All. Why do so many religious believers quickly embrace conspiracies? That's a very interesting question, which we're not going to address. And I'll, 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 I'll address it just a little bit at the very end, but but it's a really interesting question. And, and it's, it, his, uh, the article is basically written by a, a woman named Julia Dewan, who observes that most of the people who advance these kinds of things to her are amongst her more religious, conservative, religious friends online. Why is it? So? She's just making this observation anecdotally, but then she be, it's the premise then for her article. Uh, why do so many religious believers quickly embrace conspiracies? Let me give you some principles that will help you think clearly about this so that you may uh, be more reasonable in your response. So here's the first principle, principle number one, write it down if it's helpful. There is a difference between what is possible and what is reasonable. If you follow my work at all, you know that I, 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 I sit on this issue a lot. I, I preach this issue a lot because anything and everything is possible. It's possible you're not even awake today. You've dreamed this entire day so far. It's possible the entire universe is nothing more than a computer simulation, but this does not make it reasonable. And the standard is not beyond a possible doubt. It is beyond a reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubts are the doubts that are grounded in evidence. Possible doubts are really a product of our imagination. And so that standard in criminal trials is beyond a reasonable doubt, not beyond a possible doubt. Now, look, when someone sends me a, a, a video of a conspiracy and, and asks me, is this possible? I'm going to say, yeah, but that doesn't matter. What matters is, is it reasonable? And by the way, you're only going to discover if something is reasonable rather than just possible by digging through the evidence as thoroughly as you can. Now, I'll tell you, this is going to be an overarching theme as I talk to you today about this. This requires some effort on our part 
to determine if this claim, whatever the claim may be, is simply in the realm of possible or if it's based on enough evidence to rise to the level of reasonable. Now, I want to tell you something else later on in my principle set of principles, and that is that you have to own the investigative process. You cannot trust others to tell you what the evidence means. So if someone claims uh, presents three pieces of evidence to make their claim, X, Y, and Z, if you haven't gone out to verify X, Y, and Z, you cannot say anything about it yet because you haven't verified what the claim is. Anyone can make a claim. All claims are possible. Not all are reasonable. Here's my first point of advice to you. Stop posting stuff that's in the possible category. Only post stuff that's in the reasonable category. And by the way, you'd have to do a pretty decent investigation on your own before you could ever move something from possible to reasonable. That means that when someone sends you something and you go, wow, and 15 seconds later, you're posting it on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, you haven't done any of the work that has moved it from possible to reasonable. Don't post possibles. Only post investigated reasonables. And that means that's going to slow you down quite a bit because until you've done that work, you can't be posting. I want you to stop posting anything you haven't personally vetted. So if someone's being interviewed on a video, uh, have you investigated who that person is who's being interviewed? Have, have you done as much research as you can online to dis discover what is the personal history of that person being interviewed? Have you done as much research as you can to see who was the person doing the interview? If you have it, you can't post it. It's That's only in the possible range. It's not in the reasonable range yet. You haven't even discovered if it's evidentially reasonable yet. I was watching one of these videos, and I'm watching some, some B-roll. Some, some, they're talking about an arrest that was made, and they're showing a SWAT team making an arrest. To the best of my knowledge, that is not from the actual arrest. That is a SWAT team making an arrest at a different location. They grabbed it as what we call B-roll. It's just there to explain as you're talking, but it's not evidence. It's not actually a video from the actual event, as far as I can tell. If that's the case, I'm already suspicious. I just want you to take the time. Have you chased down every claim? If, if they've got a, a video, for example, they're citing some newsreel. Have they edited the newsreel? Have you gone back and found the entire newsreel so you can source it? If you haven't sourced this stuff personally, why would you share it with anybody? I think we've got to be very careful. That's the first principle. Understand the difference between possible and reasonable. One real quick uh, second principle before we move to a break. And that is that remember, there are only three motives for any misbehavior. Only three motives. Sex, money, power. That's it. There's no fourth motive. I've worked uh, enough homicides, burglaries, robberies, sex crimes, uh, larceny, whatever it is. I've worked those cases. They're only driven by three motives. There are only three motives for any sin, only three motives for any misbehavior. It's sexual uh, desire, it's uh, financial greed, and the pursuit of power. If somebody seeks, has something to gain in one of those three areas, I think it's fair for you to be suspicious. If you don't have anything to gain in those three areas, then that's different. This is why I trust what the apostles were telling me about Jesus. They had nothing to gain in those three areas, and it cost them their lives. I, I'm actually I feel much more confident about them. But if someone has to gain as by producing a video, financial gain, or by making a claim, because look, all of us are authors. Aren't we just trying to advance the cause of our books? Or is it a matter of having a huge response? How many times do these conspiracy theories get uh, uh, shared online? That's a power issue. That's a, that authority, power, fame. Those are all things that are nuanced versions of the pursuit of power. So before you start sharing some things, ask yourself, mm, boy, does the person who posted, who actually created this thing, see have anything to gain in those three areas if they have i might want to pause before i just bite and just assume what they're saying is true first principle difference between possible and reasonable the second principle understand what drives misbehavior and if you think there's a lane that somebody might gain hesitate before you share it we'll come back i'll give you a couple more principles that'll help you uh, to evaluate these conspiracy theories in light of the pandemic i'll be right back here at cross-examine radio friends can you help me with something can you go up to itunes or wherever you 
listen to this podcast and give us a five-star review. Why? It will help more people see this podcast and therefore then hear it. So if you could help us out there, I'd greatly appreciate it. All right, Jay Warner Wallace back with you here at Cross Examine Radio. I have enough faith to be an atheist with the best title of any apologetics book ever written. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist with Frank Turek. I'm sitting in for Frank uh, today uh, as he's away from the, uh, from the microphone, and I'm t- trying to give you some principles that you can use to evaluate these COVID 19 conspiracy theories that we are hearing all over the place. By the way, these will also help you evaluate any historic conspiracy theory, any historic uh, claim uh, that a large group is involved conspiring together to accomplish something we know there's a ton of these out there right i mean we've it's they're they're fun i get it when i'm speaking at uh events i will often ask people to uh, raise their hand if they enjoy reading books uh fiction books involving conspiracy theories or just reading what they think are non-fiction books reading uh, involving conspiracy theories and i i get probably most of the audience will always raise their hand at which time i tell them they're all a bunch of idiots okay because you got to be a knucklehead if you think that these are easy to pull off they are not easy to pull off. And so what I want to do in this second segment, I remember I told you the first two principles, remember that possible is not the same as reasonable. That's number one. Number two, there are three motives behind any misbehavior, sex, money, power. If you think someone's gaining something in one of those three things, I would be, hesit- I would be hesitant to start abiding that it's actually true. It may be true. Because look, these are those are the, those are also can be good motives. Sex, money, and power can drive us toward good things, but they can also drive us toward bad things. And those are the, what we typically do is take those desires on the human heart and we twist them to do something evil. But let's go to principle number three. And that I, I think if you're familiar with my work, you know that I talk about conspiracy theories and the five things, uh, the five attributes of conspiracies that are necessary in order to be successful. Remember, if you think you are aware of a successful conspiracy from the past, it wasn't by definition successful because successful conspiracies are never uncovered. Is it possible to pull off a, a conspiracy successfully? Yeah. But when it happens, it typically involves these five attributes of successful conspiracies. Why this is going to be helpful, I hope, is that because if you lack these five attributes, then you probably don't have what you think is a conspiracy. It's something other than that. So here are the five principles, uh, five attributes, rather, of a successful conspiracy. Number one, it has the smallest possible number of co-conspirators because it's a lot easier for two people to tell a lie and keep a secret than it is for 22 or 222 or some huge sector of the federal government or some huge sector of the federal government plus the CDC and and a bunch of other agencies involved in public health. The number of people matter, and the smaller number of people, the more successful you're going to be. It's just human nature, right? Especially when we are in an information age in which everyone has access to global platforms. It's one thing to keep a conspiracy 35 years ago when if you didn't have access to print media or to the news media, you couldn't even get your story out. But now anyone can get the story out. Here's the second attribute of successful conspiracies. Uh, It's held for the shortest possible period of time. So if, you, if it's a crime that it, it only takes so two weeks to unwrap it, that's a lot better and more uh, better chance you're going to be successful with that kind of conspiracy than you would if it's a two-year plan. Uh, that's why the best conspiracy is committed by two people, and as soon as it's committed, one kills the other. That's great. You only had two people to begin with, and now one of them is dead. So now you've got a really good chance of pulling this off because you're the only person in your head who knows the truth. Third thing you need is excellent communication between co-conspirators, because if you get separated and one of you guys gets jammed up by the police or jammed up by your parents or whatever it is you're trying to lie to, whoever it is you're trying to lie to, you want to be able to, 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 to tell the other what it is you said. <laughs> And your stories have to line up. And that's why the first thing we do as detectives is we separate co-conspirators and we start to get into the weeds and all the details of their story because we know the more details we get into, the less chance they have had of, of aligning their stories beforehand. And so we're able to, 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 to see the lies. So that's the third thing. Fourth attribute of successful conspiracies. They usually involve people who have a deep emotional relationship, usually familial. Uh, a mom is not going to rat off her son. Sons do rat off their moms, but not as often, right, as you would a stranger. And so if you've got deep uh, relationships 
uh, with each other, then there's a good chance you will not uh, rat on each other. Uh, so that's the the fourth principle. The last principle is try to avoid pressure altogether. If no one's asking questions, if it's not a pub, so public, if it's in this little niche category of culture where no one's or in your neighborhood or a little niche in your city where no one's really paying attention over there, you've got a good chance of pulling off a conspiracy. So this is why, for example, those five things, uh, knowing that's how I work conspiracy is all you do as an investigator is you unwrap, you unwind those five things. If somebody has three of them in their pocket, a group has three that they've mastered, you try to work the other two. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to unwind those five attributes of a successful conspiracy so it can be exposed. That's one of the reasons why when I first encountered the claim, or I knew that I had this claim in my head for a lot of years as an atheist, that, that the story of the resurrection was nothing more than a conspiracy on the part of the disciples. When you realize how big that group actually is, Paul says there are 500 in, in uh, Acts 15 that were still, most of whom were still alive, that had seen the risen Christ. There's 120 in the upper room when they replace Judas. Look, there's too many people involved. They have to hold it for too long. They can't communicate back and forth. They're not all family members, and they're under intense persecution. Uh, I just don't, this is, is it possible? I always say it's possible. Anything and everything is possible. But like I said before, it's not reasonable. And so I just don't think you can hold to that theory of, of the resurrection as being nothing more than a lie, a conspiratorial lie. The same thing, though, happens here. If you think it's going to involve vast sectors of the government for many years to make this successful, and and that in the end, uh, it, and it, by the way, you're doing it in the most public of stages, uh, yeah, okay, it's possible. Uh, you know, But evaluate it and ask yourself the question, are the five attributes of a successful conspiracy available for this? Now, that's my third principle. Understand the five attributes of successful conspiracies. But let me give you a fourth principle that's kind of related, and that is that time is your friend when you're working conspiracies, right? Because remember, the second attribute is that the shorter the, the conspiracy is being held, uh, the, the, the more likely it is to be successful. That's why when I work, I worked cold cases for most of my career. Those are just unsolved murders uh, from the past. If you're not familiar with my work, you can. I, I've been on Dateline more than any other detective in the country, so you can see some of my work. You can find more of it at coldcasechristianity.com. But my point is, I learned early on as a cold case detective that time can help you. You might think, oh, well, that's actually hurt you, right? You got a 30-year-old homicide. It, the more time that goes by, the harder it is to work. Well, in some sense, that's true. But here's what's great about it. Uh, time could be your friend in the sense that maybe somebody didn't want to talk 30 years ago because they were married to the suspect or they were married to the suspect's best friend. But now 30 years later, they're no longer married to that person. And they're actually willing to tell you more than they were willing to tell you 30 years ago. Time can actually produce some distance between some, – some people are more willing to talk as a result of time. As a matter of fact, one of the things I do when I work investigations of cold cases is I ask myself the question, okay, where in this investigation can time help me? I know it's already hurting me in, in just the age of the thing, but how can it help me? And sometimes it's just a matter of technology, right? You have technology available to you 30 years later that you didn't have 30 years ago. But time can be your friend. And when it comes to conspiracy theories that you're considering and people are sending to you on social media, remember that time is your friend. Even if this thing they're suggesting is true, well, time will tell us if it's true. Because the more now that this thing is out there, because now it's very public, it's going to end up getting vetted by whoever wants to vet it. All the truth is going to come out over time. Why would you or I? Uh, post this in, in five minutes after reading it when we know that uh, really the wiser thing to do is to let time do what it does to investigations. Time is our friend. Let's just pause on this. We have to be patient. Okay, I get that we're in an immediate culture. Everything, the biggest change I see in our culture today is not the access to information. It's that it's on demand. It's immediate. But you don't have to do that when it comes to conspiracy theories. You can wait. Time is your friend. Let me give you a fifth principle that's kind of related to the first two in this segment here, the five uh, attributes of successful conspiracies and also the fact that time is your friend. And that is that any early, early proclamation or decision or verdict you make on one of these ruins your credibility pretty much forever. 
I, 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 this happened to me. I, I was telling Frank about this, where where I, I had a case where I was on an investigative team. I was the, my very first homicide. Uh, the, my team was so much more senior to me that the senior guy on my on my team was 15 years more senior in, on the job than I was. That's a big gap in experience. And I remember walking in, looking at the evidence in the crime scene, a half an hour, an hour into it. I said, man, I, I think it's going to be X. And I gave my decision on, on my, my, my prospect on who the suspect ought to be. I was flat out wrong. It took about another week or two for us to unwrap how wrong I was. But do you think that my team, four other investigators and a sergeant, ever let me forget that? Uh, no. As a matter of fact, I didn't gain credibility, regain co- credibility on my team until all those guys had retired off the team. And I, had a, I was then the senior guy on the team. There was nobody left who remembered what an idiot I was. And proclaiming within a half an hour that I thought I knew who the suspect was. An early proclamation simply ruins your credibility. And it's awfully hard to get that back. So I don't want to be the one who is reposting uh, conspiracy theories that later on make uh, uh, cause me to lose all credibility with people who trust me for this kind of thing. Um, that's an important thing I want to talk about. I may have to push uh, a little bit here on this time, but I'm going to just get a couple of minutes before the break. <laughs> Trusted authority is key in the information age. And one of the reasons why we're struggling right now is because we don't know who to trust. All information has been weaponized. It's been politicized. So if someone says to you that their goal is to, uh, let's say, open the country, you assume that they're on the right and don't care about people and all they care about is money. And if someone says to you, you need to wear your mask and stay locked in, you assume they're on the left and all they care is about allowing the government to control them. Really, look. It's possible that we could be better motive, uh, motivated than that. We could have better motives than that, but we don't trust each other. We don't trust any authority on either side. Okay, I understand why you might not trust authority. Well, then now is the time to slow things down and do your own investigation, to be patient, not to open your mouth too, too early, because why would you trust? I get it. I understand why. And this is also true for Gen Z. This generation that's growing up with this technology don't even know which of these websites, all of which look equally authoritative, which should we trust? Well, the skeptic in me as a detective says, trust no one until you have done your homework. And that takes time. And if you can't land it with your own homework, then you can't talk about it. So I just back off. Time is your friend. Early proclamations ruin your credibility, and it's hard to find a trusted authority. We don't want people to fail to see us as a trusted authority. So there's no point. That's like the old principle, right? Better to keep quiet and appear to be foolish than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. So let's just keep those principles in mind. We'll take a break. When I come back, I'll give you another set of principles that I think will really help you to evaluate these conspiracy theories right here at Cross-Examined Radio. Friends, Frank Turek here. I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist is a listener-supported radio program and podcast. So if you like what you hear here, would you consider donating to crossexamined.org? 100% of your donations go to ministry. 0% to buildings. We're completely virtual. So if you can help us out, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Jay Warner Wallace sitting in for Frank Turek, who's away from the microphone on cross Examine Radio. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I want to share with you, continue sharing with you uh, from my cold case detective experience, having worked conspiracies, I'm continuing to share with you some principles that will help you to evaluate these conspiracy theories that are landing on our, our inbox, that are landing on our social media pages involving the COVID-19 uh, all these different conspiracies about how it started, when it started, who's involved, in it, what the overarching plot of this is. We talked about several things, the difference between possible and reasonable. Keep that in mind, the three motives that are behind any misbehavior, uh, giving you five attributes of a successful conspiracy, and this principle that time is your friend and that any early proclamation will ruin your credibility. We're now at principle six. Principle six. Now, look, I will just tell you that human nature alone, especially from a biblical worldview, Uh, tells me something, and my investigations have proved it to me, and that is that our human nature is, uh, how can I say it nicely? We are lazy. Rather than, in other words, if we can get something quickly with the less effort, uh, we will. 
rather than say, I'm going to take the long way around and spend a lot of effort to get the same thing. And for that reason, I know that opportunistic is always a better explanation than diabolical. Hear what I just said. Opportunistic is always a better explanation in criminal investigations than diabolical. Look, we're not all like, you know, Bond villains, okay, where we have this diabolical plot to overthrow the world. And we have been working secretly with some nefarious organization to undermine the good guys. Okay. That that, that I get it that that's that's we love these kinds of of, of ideas. But the reality of it is most of us are not Bond vill- villains. And every time I've I've tried to out clever the bad guy. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, so how did he do this? I'm trying to reconstruct the crime, trying to reconstruct his movement before the crime, reconstruct his movement as he's fleeing from the crime. I have a tendency to give the suspect more credit than he or she is worth. Because in the end, we default to the easiest, quickest uh, thing that involves the least amount of commitment and the least amount of effort. And so that's why when I see that someone is acting at the end of a bunch of chaos I, it's more than likely that that person just stepped up and saw the chaos and said, how can I, how can I uh, be opportunistic and, and gain something from this rather than he's involved or she's involved with 15 more people to start the chaos. And a lot of times what we see at the end here, we've got this, okay, something bad has happened. We've got a pandemic. Uh, at the end, right now, where we are at this date in time, relative to the, our experience of the pandemic, a lot of stuff's already happened and people will now seize on opportunities for advantage. Seize on opportunities for uh, gain, personal gain, in one of those three areas we talked about, sex, money, or power. And this does not mean that people have been involved. They have been involved with all kinds of people prior, okay? This does not mean that because uh, what more than likely what simply happened is that somebody is taking an opportunity to gain something um, at the end of a bunch of chaos. The simpler explanation is always better than the complex explanation. Does that make sense? This is why it's really important for us to keep that in mind as we evaluate any of this stuff, is that simpler is better than, uh, is always more uh, reasonable and more likely than complex because people are opportunistic at the end. This is true for all suspects. If you leave your front door open, there's a good chance someone is going to say, I got it doesn't mean he worked with your, a day in advance to get you to leave the front door open. People just seize on opportunities. And, and by the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this in. I wasn't going to be uh, in my list of principles to give you, but this is an extra one. This is free. It's not going to cost you any more to get this. Uh, but, but anyone can make an evidential case for anything. It's the question is whether it's a good case or not, or whether it's their most reasonable inference, and what are they hiding from you? But don't think for a second that I couldn't make a case that there's a plot that caused me to leave my front door open. So this guy at the end of all that nonsense ends up walking through my front door. You could probably find some way to make a case for that. It does not mean that's true. Even if I can make a case, oh, I see this and I see that. Really? It's still more than likely just somebody at the end of chaos being opportunistic rather than somebody involved in an overarching plot involving thousands to cause the chaos to begin with. I'm just going to give you that as a principle. I hope it kind of helps you to back down a little bit from some of these. Here's principle seven. Be careful with information. We're in an information age. I get it. But it can be your friend or it can be your enemy. Information can be your friend or it can be your enemy. And, And this is, by the way, defense attorneys know this. Now, this is going to be hard for me to kind of express to you, but I just want you to see how I'm thinking about it as a detective. Yeah, information can help me because somebody can tell me something that actually solves a case. But also, there's a lot of information that's superfluous that just cl- clutters the issue. And, 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 and defense attorneys look for that. And so I do my best to uncover all the information, for example, about witnesses. Uh, because defense attorneys, they find out, well, you know, your witness, 10 years before he saw this crime, he was arrested for drunk driving. Did you know that? And he lied to the police at the time and said he wasn't drinking. Now, that's a piece of information that he's going to want to bring out in trial as the defense attorney. And I'm going to kind of deal with it. Well, is the fact that he lied as a teenager about being drunk to a police officer disqualify him as a reliable witness 10 years later when he saw this crime? Uh, You know, the jury's going to have to decide that. But what defense attorneys want to do is bring up every little piece of information in order to get you to not see the forest for the trees focus on this little piece of data. Don't see the overarching evidence set. Look, there's an overarching evidence set even related to this virus, right? 
I, I read, but but you can very easily pin on one piece of information that would seem to distort the overarching information. I'll give you an example of this. This may be as an aside, but uh, I was reading uh, the New York Times in the opinion section. Uh, Mara Gay wrote an article, and she's a columnist there. She's a member of the editorial board. Uh, her article is called, I wish I could do something for you, my doctor said. And it's her as a 30-ish year old who uh, had a, a bout with coronavirus that dang near killed her and has left her still reeling. And so her argument is, hey, 30-year-olds get this and they get very, very – as a matter of fact, uh, the subline here is young, healthy people like me are getting very, very sick from the disease caused by the coronavirus. There is no doubt that her story is compelling and that there are people who will experience exactly what she has experienced. I'm not here to judge whether you know, that's true or not. I'll take her on, her on her word that everything she experienced is true. But that's a single piece of data. If you look at the actual COVID-19 data from the New York City uh, Health Department, uh, it talks about how many people are hospitalized based on age. And I'm looking at that right now. It's at the um, the said website is the uh, NYC Health site. It's nyc.gov site. And if you look at the number of people in her age group, now, unfortunately, they only categorize 18 to 44, which is useless to me. I need to know how many are in their 20s, how many are in their 30s, how many in their 40s. But even if you include people who are, are 44 years of age, the hospitalization and death rate is incredibly low. I mean, it's like it's it's next to nothing compared to the other groups by, based on the data coming out of the city in which she is writing this article. So, so again, I want to hear her story. But information, if it's not in the context of the overall circumstantial case with all the 150 pieces of evidence related to my suspect, all it becomes is a distraction. It's not representative of the, how strong my case is. It's just the thing that can sometimes take us on a rabbit trail. Conspiracy theories, when they land on your inbox and you're looking at them, can often just be another piece of information that is not in context with the overarching body of, of data that's out there. You have to be careful with information, especially when it comes to you unvetted by way of a video in which somebody has something to gain, like we've already discussed, and in which it firmly falls in the category of possible rather than reasonable. Let me give you an eighth principle. Be wary of experts. Be wary of experts. Look, I work in criminal trials where I will bring in scientific experts to present uh, to the jury, to interpret a piece of evidence that otherwise could be tricky. Maybe it's a DNA expert or a serology expert, or it's a, a material evidence expert. Maybe it's somebody with shotgun residue or, or, or gunshot residue, or it's something like, you know, it could be any number of experts I might bring in. And they will offer an, uh, their expertise and their opinion. It's called opinion, expert opinion. Meanwhile, the defense is going to bring in a different expert who's probably better paid than my guy who just came out of the county, right? He's just a county employee. The defense has got money, and so they're going to hire the best expert in the country. And that expert is going to look at the exact same evidence, the exact same evidence, yet render a completely opposite opinion. Two experts looking at the exact same data, yet coming to two separate inferences from the data. There's a difference between facts, the data, and inferences you make from facts. Do not confuse these two things. They are different. And, and what comes to an inference is all kinds of things. You might see the data, like I see the data, but your desires, your wants, your tastes, the way you're wired, your personal history and your family, these things cause you to assess facts differently than I would assess facts. And so two separate people can come to two completely different inferences. So here's how I use experts. Even when I read them or they're offered to me by way of a conspiracy theory on a video, I use experts in, in the information age, online, print media, whatever, to collect data, not inferences. To collect data, not inferences. What I mean is they're going to say, well... Uh, so Dr. So-and-so, like in a video, a conspiracy video, Dr. So-and-so said X. Okay, that's the data. Now, they're going to infer something from that. I'm not going to follow their inference. I'm simply going to go back now. They've given me a pointer. They've said that there's actual video out there of this doctor saying this. I'm going to go get that video and watch it in its entirety, not as it's been clipped, but as in its entirety, because I'm using videos that are any kind of experts. I'm using them 
to point me to data. If someone says the data in uh, New York City it d- uh, describes this, really? Of course, I guess there's data in New York City. I'm going to go find that data in you. I'm not going to allow the expert to tell me what his or her inferences are from the data. I'm going to go back to the data. But that means you and I are going to work a lot harder than ever before. That means that every news story, every video of a conspiracy is not the end of your investigation. It's just the beginning of your personal investigation. And if you're just using and trusting as some authority, something that's sent to you, look, I've said it before when you were criminal trials, criminal investigations. If you are skeptical of everyone and assume everyone is a stinking liar, you got a better chance of solving the case than if you assume everyone is telling you the truth. Have a little discernment and skepticism, even when someone sends it, somebody you trust sends you something you don't even know how it's sourced. Let that be the place where you begin to collect data, not inferences, and that's where the work begins. It begins then. Your own personal investigation begins when that thing lands in your inbox. Let's be more discerning. It takes more time, but it's it's worth it. Take a break. I'm going to come back. I'm going to give you a last principle here, and then I'm going to give you two principles to move forward with coronavirus right after the break here at Cross-Examine Radio. Hi, friends. Frank Turek. You can only have two things. Either you can have hope or you can have despair. Every day during this coronavirus season at 1130 a.m. Eastern Time, 1030 Central, we will be live online with a new live stream called Hope One. It's at crossexamined.org. Go to crossexamined.org, and we're going to give you hope every weekday, Monday through Friday, 1130 Eastern, 1030 Central. I hope you can join me. Jay Warner Wallace back with you, sitting in. I don't have faith to be an atheist. Cross Examine Radio, sitting in for Frank Turek, who's away from the microphone this week, and has asked me to come in and kind of share with you uh, my investigative experience. Frank and I are constantly talking about conspiracy theories. And, you know, because he knows I've, I've kind of looked at some of these and he's looking for, for places where maybe I could show him something that he hasn't seen. You know, a lot of times when you're working old cold cases, you are trying to see, uh, you know, it's, it's all the old cliches. You know, you're looking for what's being, what's kind of hiding in plain sight. Well, that's true because a lot of these things have got evidence that has been sitting there for 30 years and someone missed it for 30 years and you come along and you, you try to see what's been what's been hiding in plain sight all along. It's reading between the lines. And I mean that by in the sense that I look at the transcripts of all the interviews and I'm trying to, to basically hear the words that he's not saying or she's not saying. But but they're hidden in there. They're, she's giving me clues or he's giving me clues based on other uses of words that can kind of tell me what it is that they are saying, even though they're not saying it. That's the stuff you're looking for in these kinds of cases. And that's what I'm trying to look for every time someone sends me a video or sends me a, 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 an article or describing some new conspiracy theory. So I've given you some principles that I hope will help you to discern. The difference between what's possible and reasonable. Anything's possible, not everything's reasonable. The three motives that drive misbehavior, including conspiracy theories online, and those are sex, money, or the pursuit of power. And sometimes just the number of likes and the number of views, every time they pull that video down from YouTube and it pops up someplace else, it's it's getting you know millions of views because it's just all that does by the way is just uh, motivate people to try to find it again and then share it even more when they do find it. It's over here now. Uh, principle three, the, you know the five attributes of a successful conspiracy. The fourth principle is that time is your friend. Wait, don't be so impatient when you share these things with people because time will usually tell you if it's true. The fifth principle. When you say something early and you affirm something early, you're ruining your credibility. Sixth, human nature tells us that opportunistic is always better than diabolical, more likely as an explanation than diabolical. Seven, be careful with information. Eight, be wary of experts. And now we are at the end. But I want to give you a sad truth, principle number nine. And that is this. Some people, regardless of what you say, what you do, or how this works out, are always going to cling to this conspiracy theory. They're always going to affirm these things. They are going to want to advance them over time. Um, This is how they're wired. Um, This is why when we select uh, jury trials, uh, juries rather, for criminal trials, 
we have a voir dire process and we are asking the questions that we hope will ex- will uh, help us to see which jurors um, are just not going to move. They're so inclined in one direction or the other, either pro-prosecution or pro-defense, that they will never be able to judge anything fairly, any set of evidences fairly. And you can see this. There are always a bunch of these, maybe you know, a, a half the room that you would excuse rather than put on a jury because you know that their bias is impenetrable. There's no way that they're going to surrender their preconceived notions to listen fairly to the evidence. And that's okay. I mean, that, they just are not going to be uh, usable on a jury. Um, so, so this is going to happen. You're going to you're going to find people who are unreasonable, and your inclination is to want to engage those people and kind of like you know beat them with a stick. You can't do that. I, I want us to try to to shift from to respond to ideas rather than to respond to people. And I try to do this in my own work. Is that yeah, somebody can be really harsh and and they're making it, they're challenging a claim that you're making or they're trying to to, to get, convince you that this conspiracy is true, and they can sometimes be a little bit biting. It's really easy to kind of respond to bad character, which just kind of lowers our character typically. But what I'd rather do is just respond to the idea, and not the person. As a matter of fact, I have not shared with you today, um, aside from an article. Uh, which conspiracy theories and which videos are out there? I'm not. I don't. I'm not going to talk about the people involved in these. I'm not going to get specific to the people I trust or don't trust who might be sharing these. I just want to deal with the ideas. I don't need to vilify the people in order to, to to vilify the ideas. We are called to hate bad, bad ideas, evil ideas. But we are not called to hate evil, uh, to hate people who who have, hold bad ideas. We're called to love the people who hold bad ideas. Um, you know, God hates evil. That's one thing. We're to hate evil, but we're not to hate the people who hold bad ideas. You know, we're, we're here, to, either one, to, to, to persuade them, hopefully. But I'm not going to, I'm going to stay focused on the ideas. That's the ninth principle. Stay focused on the ideas. Now, as we t- turn a corner here, I've got a few minutes left here before this show is over today. I, I want to just help you to move forward with some. So these are not principles in dealing with uh, um, conspiracy theories so much as they are just some ideas about how we move forward in the face of coronavirus. Um, I read to you in the beginning, at least the title of this Get Religion article about why do so many religious believers quickly embrace conspiracy. My pers- first piece of advice moving forward is for the church. You know, they, they, you can offer, and you, I've just told you it's from May 12th at getreligion.org. Um, but you can find the article. You can kind of see what this writer, Julia Dewan, has to say about, about why she thinks that religious folks, such as ourselves, uh, are quick to embrace conspiracies. I will say this to you. I think the time is now for us to become a much more thoughtful church. And I'll be honest, I'm not surprised that in many places within the church in America and globally, that that, that we are encouraged um, to embrace the truth of Christianity without even looking at any evidence for it. Um, that we, uh, I was struck not too long ago by Peter Bogosian, who is a philosopher out of, I think, University of, or- of uh, Portland. Uh, who wrote a book on, on to, 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 to persuade, to help people to deconvert Christians back to, 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 to atheism if they weren't there before, to atheism if they were back to atheism. And he argued that you don't need to share evidence with Christians because Christians don't make decisions based on evidence. They usually make decisions based on personal experience. You need instead to help them understand why it's important to not make decisions based on emotion or experience, but to make decisions based on evidence. Well, I actually think as a Christian, that's how I made my decision about Jesus. I made my decision based on the evidence. I'm one of those few people you might meet who can actually tell you that it was the evidence for Christianity that persuaded me to even look seriously at what the Bible said about me, let alone Jesus. But I will tell you that if, if we if we aren't the kind of church, the kind of group, and you, you're, every church is different, so you'll just speak for your own church. If we aren't the kind of group that assesses evidence to make decisions, even about God, even about Christianity, then why would you expect us to be the kind of group that assesses things evidentially when they're presented to us? I think we could create a culture within the church in which we actually do assess facts 
to make decisions. And that's what we have to do here, is to assess facts to make decisions. But I don't know that we have a culture in the church that makes that a high priority. And when I ask people around the country, why are you a Christian? The most popular answer is because I was raised in the church. The second most popular answer is because I had an experience that demonstrated for me that Christianity is true. A prayer was answered. I had an experience of the Holy Spirit, something that's experiential, often emotional, that confirmed for them that Christianity is true. By the way, those are the same two reasons why my Mormon family says they're Mormon. They had an experience of the Holy Spirit that confirmed for them that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. The Book of Mormon is true. Or they were just raised in a ward. That's all they've ever known. You don't believe those two answers make Mormonism true. Why would you believe those two answers will make Christianity true? They don't. We can do better than that. Because this is what Frank and I have been spending our entire ministry trying to do. So I think we need to shift as we be a thoughtful, evidential church. We will be far more likely to be thoughtful and evidential about all kinds of other claims, including conspiracy theories. Here's my second piece of advice for the I've got three minutes to make it. Police work often is what I call the art of changing, changing something. You get called as a, as a patrol unit to a to a call, and you get there, and there's some uh, commotion. There's uh, maybe a domestic violence call, or there is a uh, maybe a loud noise. A party is going on, so you're called to this scene to kind of deal with it. I tell trainees, trainees need to know this as you're training as a police officer. We get there. Our goal is to change something so that we won't get called to come back here in 15 minutes. If we don't change anything, we just come and say, oh, that's nice. And we walk away. Guess what? Something bad is going to happen. We're going to get called back in 15 minutes. Instead, what we're going to go is look at get, so We're going to land there. We're going to say, OK, what's going on? What is the one or two things I can change that will solve the problem so I'm not called back here in 30 minutes? Maybe somebody needs to go to jail. Maybe it's just some advice needs to be given, and if it's listened to, you're good. Something's got to change, though, in that mess, that chaos, or you're going to get called back. Look, the same thing is happening here. We've got a situation facing us as a country. So if we don't change anything, and we saw that, right? So we locked things down. We locked things down to slow the growth of the curve, to flatten the curve. Now, what we hope is that we now have changed. Thing, either in our way of thinking with how many respirators and masks we have available, we have changed something so that now we can reopen and we won't be called back in 30 minutes with the same thing. If we don't think, then yeah, we're going to repeat itself. And I do think that some of the things that have changed for us are simply going to be that we now understand what social distancing and masks are going to do, how we're going to have to reopen, how careful, more careful we're going to have to be about contagion. And I hope that we have, as a country, ramped up our use of uh, our, our availability of masks and respirators. So we have changed something. So now we can actually leave the call and they're not going to call us again in 15 minutes. That is the goal. It's the art of change. Can you change something? So as I look forward, I got to ask, OK, do you think we've changed enough? So that we're, I'm not even going to get into that debate. That's something you probably can talk about here with Frank in the future. But I just want you to know that responding to a crisis is like responding to a call. It's all about the art of change. To hear more from me on any number of these topics, including the Christian topics, you can find me at coldchristianity.com. And I've got a kids academy for your kids 8 to 12 at casemakersacademy.com. So I hope these nine principles will help you to better evaluate conspiracy theories when people actually introduce you to them online. Let's be patient. Let's take our time. Let's consider motive. Let's be wise and thoughtful. Until next time, this is Jay Warner Wallace sitting in for Frank Turek. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist at Cross Examined Radio. See you next time. If you benefit from this podcast, help others find it. Just go to iTunes or any other podcast service you might be using to listen and leave us a five-star rating on the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast with Dr. Frank Turek. It will take you less than five seconds. You can also help a lot by leaving us a positive review for others to see. This podcast is available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many other audio content delivery apps. Thank you and God bless.